Rochelle Kwana, Ben Yehuda. Hallelujah. While we all standing, I'd like to give all thanks and praise, all acknowledgement to the supreme intelligence of the universe, Yehoah Zebaot, and even thanking him for allowing us all to be here this day. You may be seated. I'd also like to give due respect to my Abba, Chief O'Connor Ben Yehuda, thanking the Most High for his life. I'd also like to give due respect to Nasirio Ben Yasaskar, as well as Chief Kohat Ben Lewi, giving due respect to all our elders, dignitaries, Amen. Leaders, men, women, and children. And with that, I bid you in the tongue of our ancient forefathers. Shabbat shalom, shalom lakim. Shabbat shalom, shalom laka. All right, so today we get into the portion Beha Aloka. And that was a great lesson that our brother Casido just did. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, it's funny because he reminded me, I told him before he was going to be up here soon. Now he's up here more and more often. And we need people like that to speak to our people because sometimes it's good to hear a fresh voice, mm -hmm. a fresh perspective. And you never know who a person can inspire. So, yeah, Torah Yah for his life and, and the message that he brought forth. Amen. So before we get into this portion, and, you know, the, the thing I like about this portion is as we uh, begin to get through it, you know, when I, whenever I'm up here, I always tell y'all, don't worry, I ain't going to go too far past 2 o'clock. Because right here in this portion, we're going to see how our people are. You know, we, uh, first we talk about the lamp, then we talk about the purification process. As we go through it, we talk about Passover and other things. But this is that part in the book, you know, for those of us that haven't heard it before, where our people start to cry about not having something to eat. Mm. And I know my people. We know our people, and our people love to eat. So that being said, y'all don't have to worry. I'm not going to hold y'all here past two. I know my people. I know y'all like to eat. But um, before, before we get into it too much, you know, Considering like all the things that's been going on this year, even people that don't believe in God or that don't know God or know anything about this under like this this Torah, this understanding, they starting to see the signs. Mm -hmm. So it'd be remiss of us to not pay attention to all of the things that's going on in the world, because we are His people. So if anybody should be seeing the signs, it's us first and foremost. And in these times, that's when a lot of people are going to be coming to us, uh, people that you would have never thought would be asking about God, that would never be asking about Torah, that you think would live a wayward life, they see it, they recognize it. And just to kind of go off tangent before I want to say, before I say this, when we look at, you know, certain people in the book, we think about Rahab the harlot, you wouldn't think that she'd be a person that would consider God, so, but she did. And that's left on record for us to consider our people out there in the streets. Mm -hmm. Not to, you know, and I feel like that's for us to not be so judgmental towards a person's way of life because we're supposed to be a light into the nations. I'll talk about that more. But and considering, let's go to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter seven, because in everything that's going on, you know, in our personal lives and even just the world overall, that puts me into a state of consideration. And me just being me, I think all the time anyway. Sometimes I know I overthink. That's one of my uh, faults. But in doing, that, in doing so and thinking and sitting down and considering, you know, I have to say, as, as Israelites, sometimes we have to be mindful of the fact that in Israel, we become more than just each other's friends. We turn into each other's family. And I say that to say because, I, you know, I'll just use myself for an example maybe a year and a half back, uh, one of my aunts on my mother's side passed away, and it had been over 10 years since most of that side of the family had saw me. So, and them seeing me now, well not now, but then, like, wow, corn, you got big. I'm like, yeah, you know, it's been a minute. And then it made me think, and me and my brother was talking, like it's sad that more times than not, when we come together, it's because of death. Mm. And he was like, we gotta, we can't, we gotta change that. But then I had to think too, most of the days that I, you know, those of us that have family that don't do law, more times than not, when they plan a day to do something, what day is it on? It's, they typically choose a Saturday, right? Mm -hmm. So we miss it, we quote unquote, missing out on a lot of these family activities, et cetera. And I know sometimes we feel like, you know, choosing Torah is easy and yeah, you know, choosing the most high is easy, but it comes with its hardships of sometimes some of us, you do feel like you're missing out on things. 
And we could try to ignore that feeling, but it still does exist to some extent because you're missing out on being around a lot of people that you know and love. You know they miss you, they can't get to see you, et cetera. So, and that I'm thinking, you know, a lot of times, and especially for those of us that don't have a lot of family in Torah, we kind of walk away from our family family, our blood family, and we create this new family in Israel, and we build ourselves up in here, and that made me think of how we need to be more considerate and more compassionate towards one another. Because a lot of people don't have much to turn to outside of these doors. And sometimes when we, don't, we aren't mindful or considerate of our ways, we could be off-putting to someone. Why? Because you know, we just sometimes, you know, they say familiarity breeds content. So sometimes we take people for granted and not realizing like, hey, we're their new family now. A lot of people can't just run back to their family and just have life be the way that it is especially when they learn this Torah, a lot of us separate ourselves from certain things anyway. So, uh, so before we get into this portion, we're just gonna read a little bit of Ecclesiastes and we'll bring it around town. From seven? Uh, seven one, you can start with verse one. We're in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse one, hallelujah. Hallelujah. A good name is better than precious oil mm -hmm. and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Mm -hmm. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men. And the living will lay it to his heart. Vexation is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart may be gladdened. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fool is, fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise mm -hmm. than for a man to hear the song of fools. Amen. So starting from verse 1, the first thing that came to me with this, because, you know, I grew up when G-Unit came out, so 50 Cent said, death got to be easy because life is hard. It'll leave you physically and mentally, emotionally scarred. You know, and I'm just, you know, because I, I always like to read things that, I always like to read Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, things like that, because it's one of the things my Abba told me growing up is just everything you're not going to know and everything I can't teach you, but, you know, just read Proverbs and gain some wisdom. Mm. So in, in doing that and uh, reading this, it made me think about a lot of the things and the quotes that I hear from other people a good name is better than fragrant oil, the day of death than the day of birth. Why? Because all our struggles is over. And although a lot of the times, you know, the ones that we leave behind are hurt by us not being here, everything is done. So that's why we, we, when we say we're thankful for the aches and the pains, because we know that we're still here. We know that we're still here to feel. We know that we're still here to do. Like Chief Ooze just said earlier, every day that you wake up is another day to repent or another day to do better. And that's why we have to be mindful of our ways often. I'm going to move down and, you know, but it talks about the wise man and consideration. If you're not considering your ways often, you're doing yourself a disservice because none of us are perfect. None of us handle every situation the way we, uh, we could do, you know, as best as possible. So after a day is done, you laying down before, you know, you go to bed and maybe thinking the most high for allowing you to make it through the day, consider all of the things that you did throughout the day and how you could have handled them better. It even goes on to say, you know what, uh, I'm gonna read something, you don't have to go there, but Proverbs 22, uh, 22, one, it says, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and love and favor than silver and gold. Mm -hmm. And even uh, talking about that good name, that good name is very, very powerful. It's better than fragrant oil, it's better than silver and gold, it's better than any riches, why? Because money you can make back, but a good name you can't uh, regain. So that goes back to what I was saying about us creating a new family in Israel and how we should be a little bit more compassionate and more considerate of one another. Because sometimes it's, you can't unrub a person after you rub them the wrong way. And as much as we should let get things go sometimes, we're humans. Mm -hmm. We're human beings. So it's, you know, we know we're not supposed to hold grudges, but it's hard to not necessarily do that. These are things that we gotta work through. And you know, it's like, I feel like as I'm approaching 30, the most high is unlocking my mind more and more. And I'm gonna talk about that too, as we get through the portion. Don't worry, I see it's almost one o'clock, everybody. But as we uh, go through the portion too, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of the development of the mind and how society kind of messes us up. But I just feel like as the most high is allowing me to approach uh, my 30th year of life, um, He's unlocking a lot of things, and it's making me realize that as Israel, we definitely have to focus a lot more 
on just mental health and personal development. That good name, once again, it's hard to regain after you lost it. And a lot of times we may watch our friends or even people that we grew up with out there in the world, they got the nice cars, they got this, that, and the third, and we feel like we moving right and we living right, but we don't have all of the things that they have. And it's like, don't play the comparison game with them because the most high could very well take all of that away. That's right. Stick to the course, stay the path, keep your good name. Because one of the uh, things that my Abba always told me growing up, it's not the odds that you see, it's the odds that you don't. Hmm. Meaning, you never know who's watching you. A lot of time you think just because it's you know you don't see the people that you know around you. All right, now it's time to wild out. Hmm. Now I'm a bug out. Whole time you don't realize that person that know that person that know that person recognize you, and now it gets back. Now a lot of times we always worried about the eyes that see us here, you know, with one another, as if the Most High ain't watching everything anyway. That's right. But then on the flip side, on a positive note, as far as you never know who's watching you. In my own personal life, even at work sometimes, I'll have people randomly give me money. I'm like, what for? It's like, oh, no, I see how you are. You're a great young man. I, uh, people just open, like, when I say open doors, I'm not talking about physical doors, mm -hmm. but bless me with opportunities because they see how I move. They see how I am with people. So, and that good name, you never know. And, you know, it even goes further to say um, in the second verse, and I did write that down, uh, this is in Proverbs 22, too. Yah is the maker of them all. Hey, oh, no, sleek guy. The rich and the poor meet together. Yah is the maker of them all. So what that means to me is I'm not going to look at my financial standing to determine whether or not I should have some type of morale. Because me being the type of person that I am and having the type of character that I have, I may not consider myself fiscally rich, but the most I could have me sit at the table with people that's there. I've been around 100,000 years. I've been around millionaires. And I told Aya, they feel something in that spirit. And I feel like that's something that we all have. And that's why I'm, you know, very, I kind of, even though this has not too much to do with the lesson for today, but it's just one of those things where sometimes I feel like it needed to be said because oftentimes we get too caught up, you know, with the lesson. And it's like the most high put this on my spirit to say it. So I'd rather say this. And don't, trust me, we're going to get through the lesson, but this is one of those things that was on my spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, Ecclesiastes 7, 2, where it says, It is better to go to the house of mourning mm -hmm. than to the house of feasting. Right. For that is the end of every man and a living one. Oh, sleek, and a living one should take it to heart. Vexation is better than revelry. That's just like festivities. For though the face be sad, the heart may be glad. Mm. It goes back to what I was saying about consideration. And, you know, even from a personal level, and those of you that are going through what y'all going through, there's quite a bit of us that's going through a season of loss right now. Mm -hmm. And in these times, it's hard not to sit down and just consider. You know, our, our mind, this is, you know, it's deceitful above all else, but it's a powerful thing. And we're gonna, we, we spend a lot of time after we lose something, we think, and 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 we think. And that's why I'm saying here it's, it's better to go to the house of mourning because now we're put into a state of consideration. Mm -hmm. When you partying, you're not thinking about your bills. You're not thinking about your health. You're not thinking about your knee that you just hurt that's going to hurt once the alcohol wear off again. <laughs> you're not thinking about none of those things. All you're trying to do is have a good time. But it's when we're in a state of sadness or mourning where we start thinking, maybe if I didn't spend 200 at the club... <laughs> I could have paid my phone bill on time. Now my boss can't reach me. Now, you know, it's just little things like that that, and it ain't, it ain't always got to be a loss of life. It could be just a loss of anything that'll sit down and make you consider, hmm, maybe I didn't appreciate that thing when I had it. Or maybe I didn't take care of it as good as I could have. So, you know, it's just, it's good to uh, not necessarily go to the house of mourning, but take this, this time and these opportunities to sit back and reflect. Then last thing it says, I'm going to just read the last two. Wise men are drawn to a house of mourning and fools to a house of merrymaking. Mm -hmm. It is better to listen to a wise man's reproof than listen to the praise of fools. And I think of Solomon's son and how he listened to his friends that was around about him and increased the taxes on his people. And he caused that riff. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes we like we like to have yes men or yes women around us and telling us the things that we want to hear. But really and truthfully, the people that you want around you are the ones that will keep you in check. No, I don't think you should be doing that. No, you could have said that better. You ain't really handled that situation in the right way. You want some no peoples in your circle because not every thought that comes to our mind is right. That's right. So if you're surrounding yourself with people that's always make you feel like everything you're doing is copacetic, that's a character flaw. Work on that and surround yourself with some people that, you know, challenge your thought process. That's right. So right now we can go ahead and go into a Beha Aloka, when thou lightest or when you light. We're in the book of Numbers, the eighth chapter, starting from the first verse. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Yehovah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto Aharon and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light in front of the candlestick. And Aharon did so. He lighted the lamps thereof as so as to give light in front of the candlestick, as Jehovah commanded Moshe. And this was the work of the candlestick, beaten work of gold, unto the base thereof and unto the flowers thereof. It was beaten work, according unto the pattern which Jehovah had shown Moshe, so he made the candlestick. And this pattern you can find in Exodus chapter... Now, why did I? Oh, there we go. Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. We're mm-hmm. not going to go there right now, but it'll show you how to, you know, how it's fashioned, what they're supposed to do. Tosif. And Jehovah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. Mm-hmm. And thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them. Sprinkle the water of purification upon them. And let them cause a razor to pass over all their flesh. And let them wash their clothes and cleanse themselves. Then let, a, then let them take a young bullock. And it's meal offering, fine flour mingled with oil. And another young bullock shalt thou take for a sin offering. And thou shalt present the Levites before the tent of meeting. And thou shalt assemble the whole congregation of the children of Israel. And thou shalt present the Levites before Jehovah. And the children of Israel shall lay their hands upon the Levites. And Aharon shall offer the Levites before Jehovah for a wave offering from the children of Israel, that they may be to do the service of Jehovah. And the Levites shall lay their hand upon the head of the bullocks, and offer thou the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering unto Jehovah to make atonement for the Levites. And thou shalt set the Levites before Aharon and before his sons, and offer them for a wave offering unto Jehovah. Thus shalt thou separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. And after that shall the Levites go in to do the service of the tent of meeting, and I shall cleanse them and offer them for a wave offering. For they are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel, instead of all that openeth the womb. Even the firstborn of all the children of Israel have I taken them unto me. For all the firstborn among the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast. On the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. Most I did that for our sake. This could be found in Exodus chapter 12, verses 29 to 31. Again, we're not going to go there. We have quite a few more chapters to read. But even in considering all that the Most High God did for us in the plagues that he enacted on Egypt, and you think about how selfish our forefathers was after seeing those witness, I mean, like, uh, seeing those miraculous acts. That's right. And it, it, it just really kind of shines a light on our people. Um, Tosif. Verse 18. Mm-hmm. And I have taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel. And I have given the Levites, they are given to Aharon and to his sons from among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tent of meeting and to make atonement for the children of Israel that there be no plague among the children of Israel through the children of Israel coming nigh into the sanctuary. Thus did Moshe, Aharon, and all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the Levites. According unto all that Yehovah commanded Moshe, touching the Levites, so did the children of Israel unto them. And the Levites purified themselves, and they washed their clothes, and, and Aharon offered them for a sacred gift before Yehovah. And Aharon made atonement for them to cleanse them. And after that, went the Levites in to do their service in the tent of meeting before Aharon and before his sons, as Yehovah had commanded Moshe concerning the Levites, so did they unto them. So just in, case it's, just in case it's not clear what's happening here, this is the purification process for the tribe of Lewi and them being sanctified. So again, as we know, the Most High took out the firstborn of Egypt. So instead of, you know, Lewi is in place of that firstborn in Israel. So the Most High has them sanctified. Sleek God. So I look back at here where it talks about 
Let's see, verse 19. Mm -hmm. When I have given the Levites, they are given to Aharon and to his sons for among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tender meeting to make atonement for the children of Israel that there be no plague among them of Israel through the, gener see, God, through the children of Israel coming nigh to the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. I think about David when he numbered the people and how he brought that plague in the midst of the people. And when the Most High gave instructions, like it says right in that last verse, Moshe concerning sleep God, and before his sons, as Jehovah had commanded Moshe concerning the Levites, so did they unto them. So when the Most High gives us instructions, it will behoove us to just do them. Twenty-four. Wait, sleep God. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Mm -hmm. There you go. And Jehovah spoke unto Moshe, saying, "This is that which pertaineth unto the Levites, from twenty and five years old and upward. Mm -hmm. They shall go in to perform the service and the work of the tent of meeting." And from the age of 50 years, they shall return from the service of the work and shall serve no more, but shall minister with their brethren in the tent of meeting to keep the charge, but they shall do no manner of service. Thus shalt thou do unto the Levites, touching their charges. Ain't that beautiful 25 years of work? That's it. Uh, so now to talk about a little bit of the brain, our human minds. 25 is a perfect age for them to start this service because now... A lot of science, they have that age range between your mid-20s and your late 20s where your brain is, quote, unquote, completely developed. Mm -hmm. So that, may, that makes you sit back and think when you know that a lot of science and research kind of backs the idea that, you know, that, that prefrontal cortex isn't completely developed until our mid to late 20s. And you think about all of the things that happen between high school and college before we get to that point. So if our brains aren't fully developed until about, let's just go with 25, right? Let's use this number right here. Why do they allow children to get student loans? Hmm. If you think about it, why do they allow a lot of the things that they allow, considering the fact that their own research does show and prove that most of us aren't equipped. somewhat yeah, equipped to make these decisions that they allow us to make in our teenage years? Right. Because if you really, you know, you just start to look at the numbers and it say as of March is $1.78 trillion of student debt, it's like, hmm, they're letting a lot of young people take out student loans. And I, I saw a video the other day that at 18, I can't go to the bank to get a business loan for $10,000, but I can get a $50,000 student loan hmm. all at the age of 18. And my phone disrespected me and not letting me see my notes, but hold on. <laughs> but even in that, the more you learn, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's like, it's a good thing and a bad thing. Because once you start to begin to understand the education system in America, you know that in a sense it kind of sets you up for failure. And in today's time, I feel like, and I could be right, but I feel like that a lot of us, you know, we don't realize America sets us up for a modern day version of sharecropping. Hmm. Where they keep us tied to this land by ha developing all these debts. So we get student loans, you know. Mortgages, car loans, credit cards. Nowadays, they got what? Klarna, Afterpay, you name it. Any and every form of credit that's possible, that's what they do and they give it to us. And more times than not, it's going to be impoverished people that buy into these things because it sounds good at the moment. You know, we, 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 we want that immediate gratification, not realizing that them interest rates pile up. And that's how they get you. It's like, uh, it's not just real. But it goes again back to that development of the brain and them understanding, hey, I can create a perpetual employee if I put them in debt right now. Mm -hmm. Then even all of the other decisions, ah, told I. It's okay. They create perpetual employees, which is why a lot of us are a slave to the system in a way, because most people, especially here in New York, are somewhat living from paycheck to paycheck. How can you focus on improving? How can you focus in on developing? How can you focus on nation building when more times than not, most of us are just focused on our bills? So it like, it's, this is one of those situations, and I'm an avid chess and checker player, but this is one of those situations where they are playing chess, and we're playing tic-tac-toe. Mm. Like, that's how far behind we are. We're not even on a chessboard. I mean, uh, Sika. We're playing chess. They're playing tic-tac-toe. Mm -hmm. We're not even playing on a checkerboard. 
that's how far ahead of us they are because we we like they got the game so good on lock mm-hmm. that every every step that you think about taking they already got something else figured out there's so much division not just in israel but even in our communities outside of israel then we got the men versus women thing. Then we got the mm. colorism thing. Then we got the uh, I'm ashamed this person for their occupation thing. Mm. We have a million and one fights within every community. And, you know, let's just think bigger than Israel because at the end of the day, we are supposed to be a light to the people. So let's just think a little bit bigger than Israel. There's a million and one fights in the world and only one person is not losing. Uncle Sam. Mm. He's winning no matter what. Why? Because mm. you all are paying your taxes. He take the money out to check. He take money when you spend your money. He take money when you making money. He just keep taking money whenever he Uncle Sam keep taking money and we fighting with each other. Hmm. I don't even want to. I don't even want to say too much because I just feel like it's one of those things where the more you talk, you know Uncle Sam is watching, and that's why we all know we have to be mindful of the things that we say when we up here because YouTube's community guidelines and now there's a lot of censorship to our First Amendment. So we could talk a whole bunch of hate towards each other. Mm-hmm. If I start talking about beefing with another camp or beefing with other black people, or if I talk against Christianity to Islam, like, okay, all right, all right, the blacks are still fighting amongst each other. Mm. The minute I start talking about how Uncle Sam is robbing us, <laughs> that's when you're going to get the bots in the chat that start putting stuff, and that's when mm. they're going to find little things to look for because there's a bigger fight than the things that we be concerned about. Mm. So a lot of these problems that we have are because we were allowed to make bad decisions before the age of 25 to 30. And I'm gonna give some advice to you young men that my father did give me. I ain't listen, but it is what it is. He gave it to me. Wait till you about 30. You know, wait till you're in your late 20s, 30s. Establish yourself more. Work on yourself, establish yourself. Make sure you accomplish the things that you wanna accomplish before you start trying to have a family and build a life. You wanna establish all of these things. I, uh, I feel like I was gonna go somewhere else with that, but I'm not. Because let's get to this portion. Otherwise, I'll go on a whole tangent, and I'll end up being one of those long-winded teachers. Chapter uh, 9. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Yehovah spoke unto Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel keep the Passover in its appointed season. In the fourteenth day of this month at dusk, you shall keep it in its appointed season according to all the statutes of it, and according to all the ordinances thereof shall you keep it. And Moshe spoke unto the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover in the first month on the 14th day of the month at dusk in the wilderness of Sinai. According to all that Yehovah commanded Moshe, so did the children of Israel. But there were certain men who were unclean by the dead body of a man, so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moshe and before Aharon on that day. And those men said unto him, We are unclean by the dead body of a man. Wherefore are we to be kept back so as not to bring the offering of Jehovah in its appointed season among the children of Israel? And Moshe said unto them, Stay ye, that I may hear what Jehovah will command concerning you. All right, so this is just for the person that missed Passover because they literally couldn't make it. This is not for someone who deliberately decided not to show up. Right. So let's make that difference, distinction. I know sometimes, I mean, this is a lot of times... A lot of times things like this is pretty clear, but just to make it clear right here, because I know we have people in today's time that feel like because we're not in the land, we don't have to keep these holy days. But even even then right here with this one, sleek eye. Right here with this one, this is showing you that even if you miss it, you still gotta keep it. That's right. For, but again, these are extenuating circumstances. Tosif. And Yehovah spoke unto Moshe saying, speak unto the children of Israel saying, If any man of you or all of your generation shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto Jehovah. In the second month on the fourteenth day at dusk, they shall keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread with bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break a bone thereof. According to all the statue of the Passover, they shall keep it. But the man that is clean and is not on the journey and forbeareth to keep the Passover, that soul shall be cut off from his people, because he brought not the orphan of Jehovah in its appointed season, that man shall bear his sin. Mm-hmm. And if a stranger shall sojourn among you, and you will keep the and will keep the Passover unto Jehovah, according to the statute of the Passover, and according to the ordinance thereof, so shall he do. He shall have one statute both for the stranger and for him that is born in the land. So see. 
And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up to the, the cloud, covered the tabernacle, even the tent of the testimony, and that even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it, and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud was taken up over the tent, then after the children of Israel journeyed, and in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel encamped. At the commandment of Yehovah, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of Yehovah, they encamped. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they remained in camp. And when the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of Yehovah and journeyed not. And sometimes the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle. According to the commandment of Yehovah, they remained in camp. And according to the commandment of Yehovah, they journeyed. And sometimes the cloud was from evening until morning. And when the cloud was taken up in the morning, they journeyed. Or if it continued by day and by night, when the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Whether it were two days or a month or a year, that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, abiding thereon, the children of Israel remained in camp and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed at the commandment of Yehovah, they encamped, and at the commandment of Yehovah, they journeyed. They kept the charge of Yehovah at the commandment of Yehovah by the hand of Moshe. God's timing. So that's what I got from reading this part. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of us, we feel like things are supposed to happen in the time in which we feel like it's supposed to happen. It says... And sometimes the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle. Then let's see, it talks about it being from evening until morning. Sometimes for a month, I mean a day, two days, a month, a year. So that's why 11 day journey took about 40 years. And that made me think a lot of times in our lives we become impatient because we feel like I'm doing this, I'm doing that, this didn't happen yet. Or I, I'm, I'm living right, I'm doing things a certain way and this ain't the season that the Most High wanted to happen for you. This ain't the time yet. So a lot of the times we make ourselves anxious, we make ourselves impatient, we even get a little angry because we feel like it's not happening quick enough. I need this to happen a little bit faster. And I'm looking right here, they moved, sometimes they waited for how long? A month or a year just to go an 11 day journey, right? That's what, give or take. They say about six days now, I guess if you just take a straight path. But even then, sometimes the destination may seem so close in a lot of the things that we want to attain in our lives, but we aren't who we're supposed to be to attain them yet. This is that the same way the Levites got, had that purification process where they had to shave and have this happen and that happen. That same process is going on right here with these people, and that same process is going on in our lives, whereas... We might think we're ready to receive a blessing and we're not. And, and more times than not, when you're not ready to receive something that you think you're supposed to have, you fumble it. You end up not being able to maintain it the right way or you don't appreciate it, so you end up losing it. So in that season of impatience, you know, in that season of impatience, when you're feeling like, why am I not reaping the rewards of the work that I'm putting in? Why I'm not receiving the things that I feel like I'm supposed to receive? Sit back and consider. That's exactly how I started off this lesson. Why? Because as you, can, as you read this book, one of the things that you really see in our forefathers is that they didn't do much considering. Mm. Most high, I, you know, he brought you literally out of Egypt, and you have a whole bunch to complain about. You have a whole lot to say. We're going to get to some, one of the complaints a little bit later, mm -hmm. but what that shows you is a lack of consideration. Oh, just because things aren't going your way right at this moment, you forget all of the goodness that was given unto you before. Right. And sometimes we like that in our own lives, whether it be with loved ones, parents, children, whatever, whatever situation could come to your mind. You know, sometimes we're the ones that take for granted. Sometimes we're the ones that's taken for granted. But when we, you know, when we look at this and we see, hmm, that's our people. That's who we come from. Help you better understand how to work through all the things that's going on with you. So... Tosif, chapter, chapter 10. 10. Yep. And Yehovah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, mm -hmm. of beaten work shalt thou make them, and they shall be unto thee for the calling of the congregation and for causing the camps to set forward. And when they shall blow with them, all the congregation shall gather themselves unto thee at the door of the tent of meeting. And if they blow but with one, then the princes, the heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. And when ye blow in along, the camps that lie on the east side shall take their journey. And when you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that lie on the south side shall set forward. And they shall blow an alarm from their journeys. But when the assembly is to be gathered together, ye shall blow. 
for ye shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aharon the priests shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for a statue forever throughout your generations. And when you go to war in your land against the adversary that oppresseth you, then ye shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. Ye shall be remembered before your whole your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Also, in the day of your gladness and in your appointed seasons and, and in your new moons, ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be to you for memorial before your God. I am your whole your God. Amen. And it came to pass in the second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, that the cloud was taken up from before the tabernacle, from see God, from over the tabernacle of the testimony. And the children of Israel set forward by their stages out of the wilderness of Sinai, and a cloud abode in the wilderness of Panar. And they took their first journey according to the commandment of Jehovah by the hand of Moshe. And in the first place, the standard of the camp of the children of Yehuda set forward according to their host. And over his host was Nachshon, the son of Aminadab. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Yisachar was Netan El, the son of Zuar. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Zebulun was Eliab, the son of Helon. And the tabernacle was taken down. And the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari, who bore the tabernacle, set forward. And the standard of the camp of Reuben set forward according to their host. And over his host was Elizor, the son of Shedeor. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Shimon was Shalumiel, the son of Zerishadai. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Gad was Eliasaph, the son of Deuel. And the Kohathites, the bearers of the sanctuary, set forward, that the tabernacle might be set up against their coming. And the standard of their camp, of the camp of the children of Ephraim, set forward according to their host. And over his host was Elishama, the son of Amihu. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Manasseh was Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Benjamin was Abidan, the son of Gidoni. And the standard of the camp of the children of Don, which was the rearward of the, all the camps, set forward according to their host. And over his host was Achiezer, the son of Amishadai. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Ashir was Pagiel, the son of Akram. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Naphtali was Akira, the son of Enan. Thus were the journey, see God, thus were the journeyings of the children of Israel according to their host, and they set forward. You can keep reading. Yeah, because yeah. that's just pretty straightforward, the princess and stuff. Uh, verse 29. And Moshe said yeah. unto Hobab, the son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moshe's father-in-law, We are journeying unto the place of which Jehovah said, I will give it you. Come thou with us, and we will do thee good, for Jehovah have spoken good concerning Israel. And he said unto him, I will not go, but I will depart to mine own land and to my kindred. And he said, Leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, and thou shalt be to us instead of eyes. And it shall be, if thou go with us, yea, it shall be that what good soever Jehovah shall do unto us, the same will do unto the same will we do unto thee. And they set forward from the mount of Jehovah three days journey. And the ark of the covenant of Jehovah went before them three days journey to seek out a resting place for them. And the cloud of Jehovah was over them by day when they set forward from the camp. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moshe said, Rise up, O Jehovah, and let thine enemies be scattered. And let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Yahweh, unto the ten thousands of the families of Israel. I'll, I'll let you breathe for a second. I'll mm -hmm. say a little bit of something. I know you want to get mm -hmm. some water, too. Mm -hmm. To Yahweh be the victory. Hallelujah. So the reason why I just uh, let Chief Mechel keep reading, a lot of this is pretty straightforward. As you can see, it's saying what it says. Not too much for me to break down, so I'm not going go too much into that only because I know what's coming. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But we always going to win a fight when we have the most high on our side. That's right. Chapter 11. And the people were as murmurers, mm. speaking evil in the ears of Yehoah. And when Yehoah heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of Yehoah burnt among them and devoured in the uttermost part of the camp. Wait, and so it said they were speaking evil amongst each other, right? And the people were as murmurous, speaking evil in the ears of Yehovah. So sometimes we think when we're talking about a person, and just because we're talking Jesus. to another person. That's right. We, 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 uh, and it's just one of those things where I don't even want to say it, but I feel like we really, some of us really don't believe in the most high. The way we conduct ourselves towards one another, the way we speak about one another when we think some other don't hear. Right. It's like, do you really, really believe that the most high is omniscient? Do you really believe that the Most High is omnipresent? That's right. Because would you be saying these things if you knew that person was right there? So if you respect their presence enough to not say it in front of them, 
be cognizant of the fact that the Most High's presence is everywhere. So you speaking negative about them like the Most High don't hear it. Mm. As it is with our forefathers in Moshe. All of the time, every time they speaking bad about him, or always have something negative to say against him, or you brought us out here to die. And it's like, you're not speaking against Moshe. Right. Moshe didn't decide to go on this mission by Matter of fact, we all read it, and if you knew online and you didn't get a chance to, go ahead and read it. Go look in Exodus. Moshe really didn't even feel like he was fit to be put on this mission. So this is who the Most High chose to, you know, lead us through all these journeys and lead us out of Egypt. Whole time, we getting what we asked for, mm -hmm. and now we crying about it. Right. We complaining about it, not realizing the one that we offending ain't the person that, you know, we see there. Tosif? And the people cried unto Moshe, mm -hmm. and Moshe prayed unto Yehovah, and the fire abated. Right. And the name of that place was called Habera, because the fire of Yehovah burnt among them. How many times? Well, I ain't gonna say how many times, because I'm pretty sure none of us might have it offhand, but we, we put ourselves in a position to be prayed for by the same person that we was talking about. I ain't talking about us in our personal lives. I'm talking about right here in this book. Mm. These people, and that's, that goes right back to Moshe's character. He knows that these people are talking about him. He knows that they don't like him. He knows that they don't respect him. And really and truthfully, they probably would want to do something to him. But they, they respect his presence enough to know that putting hands on him might not be the smartest thing. However, they do all of this talking and murmuring and backbiting. And what does he do after hearing and knowing all of these things? It says, and, and the people cried unto Moshe, and Moshe prayed unto Yehovah. That's right. Now, let's fast forward to the Gregorian year 2023, Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> United States of America. How many of us have enough strength in our spirit to pray for someone that we know is just talking about us, just saying all, any and every disgusting thing you could think about you? I know most of us here is from Brooklyn. Even if you're not, you're from New York. So I know that attitude that we guys be in New Yorkers. Nine times out of ten, I'm pretty positive ain't too many of us going to have too many kind words, even in our prayers, for somebody that we know is talking sideways about us. Again, this goes to testament to Moshe's character, where despite the fact that they don't have no love for him, he know that there's a bigger picture. It's not about him. It's not about Israel. It's not about nothing that we can see. It's about the Most High. So this mission has to be accomplished no matter what people say about me, no matter what people say about y'all, let's bring it here to 2023 again. A lot of the times we get over emotional because of situations and words and it's just like, there's a bigger picture. Something has to be accomplished before we all, you know, we all have our, everybody has their day. Hopefully it's far from now, but we have more to accomplish and there's more things to be done. So let's just be a little bit more like Moshe have a little bit more grace, a little bit more compassion, a little bit more understanding. Because when a person, especially, and this doesn't really happen, so, but let's just say I'm at work and someone's a little bit verbally aggressive, I keep my calm. More times, more times than not, you seem more dangerous when you stay calm in a dangerous situation. Like, why he not scared? You know, that's what people are like, why he so calm? What he got on him? Something like that. But it's just like, you, believe it or not, you handle that situation better than going back and forth and returning that energy. Even in Proverbs, it tells you not to go down to the level of a fool, because mm -hmm. now you look like one. Mm -hmm. So, let's be more like Moshe. Tosif? Verse four. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept on their part and said, would that we were given flesh to eat. Mm. We remember the flesh, the fish, which we were want to eat in Egypt for naught. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all. We have not saved this manna to look to. Wow. Keep going. Toss it, toss it. Mm -hmm. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and the appearance thereof as the appearance of Bedellian. The people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in mortars and seeded it in pots and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of a cake bed with oil. And when the dew fell upon a camp in the night, then the, fam the manna fell upon it. And Moshe heard the people weeping, family by family, every man at the door of his tent. And the anger of your whole was kindled greatly. And Moshe was displeased. What you gave, what you gave me is not good enough. I want something else, y'all. Mm. That's what they said. Yep. 
you know, sometimes we like to work around it and word it in a way that's a little bit pretty, but it's, you, you know, they, uh, our forefathers, and these are our forefathers, they spitting in the most high face. They say beggars can't be choosers. You getting free food, and you talking about what you had when you was in your abusive situation. Oh, well, I had this, and I had that, I had this, that, and the third. I watch, you know how they do the street interviews and stuff, like mm-hmm. TikToks, Instagram, and stuff. <laughs> they, so they asked a bunch of different women, would you rather be in an abusive relationship where everything is paid for, or a normal relationship but you got to foot like most of the bills. What y'all think they chose? <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to So th- this is our people. We, we, talk, we beg to get out of Egypt, but every time we're talking about, oh, but this is what we had when we was there. Oh, man, it was so good when I used to, I used to, I could ride in a Mercedes this week and I had the Lamborghini that week, you know, and, and it's just like you asked to get out of here. And, and, and again, it talks about that one cry. So it's not like a few people was asking to get out of Egypt. Israel was asking to get out of Egypt. Now we got what we asked for, and now we're complaining about it every week. So, Steve, because I want to get to this next part. And Moshe said unto Yehoah, Wherefore hast thou dealt ill with thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Mm -hmm. Have I conceived all this people? Have I put them forth that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father carries the sucking child unto the land which thou didst swear unto their fathers? When should I have flesh to give unto all these people? For they trouble me with their weeping, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people myself alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee. Out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me, look, let me not look upon my wretchedness. Wow. Whew. This what I this 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 the type of spirit he went from praying for them to just asking to die. That's that's what our people put him through. So those of y'all that are in leadership positions and y'all going on emotional roll y'all go through most emotional roller coasters. Let me slow down. And y'all go through emotional roller coasters because of all of the things that y'all may see y'all people going through or y'all may feel y'all be put through. Uh keep going. Uh, you know, keep on trucking. You know, uh put up the good fight. You know, all them old sayings that y'all used to have back in the 50s and 60s. Just keep on with the keeping on, because uh, y'all ain't going through half of what Moshe went through. But we can see right now, he's kind of he's kind of fed up to the That's point right. that he's asking, you know what? Uh, I done had it with your people. That's right. Take you let somebody else lead them. I'm completely fine. I don't want to see the land. I don't want to go into it. I don't even want to know if my kids make it. Just take me out right now. Mm-hmm. Can y'all really imagine that? Imagine somebody putting you through that much stress. Like, you know what? If I ain't wake up in the morning, I'd be okay with that. Hmm. That's how much stress Moshe was put through. Hmm. Told Steve, because I want to get to the part I want to get to. And Jehovah said unto Moshe, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom mm-hmm. thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tent of meeting, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and speak with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou be it not thyself alone. Mm-hmm. And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of Jehovah, saying, Would that we were given flesh to eat, for it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore Jehovah will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, two days. nor five days, uh-huh. neither ten days, okay. nor twenty days, right. but a whole month until it come out of your nostrils. And it, it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have rejected Jehovah, who is among you, and have troubled him with weeping, saying, Why now came we forth out of Egypt? And Moshe said, The people among who I am, whom I am, are six hundred thousand men on foot. And yet thou hast said, I will give them flesh, that they may eat a whole month. If flocks and herds be slain for them, will they suffice them? Or if all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them, will they suffice them? And Jehovah said unto Moshe. Is Jehovah's hand waxed right short. short? Now shalt thou see whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. Mm. And Moshe oh, went hold, out. Hold on, hold on. Sleep, sorry, mm-hmm. sleep, God. So before we get there, I just want to say, we about to see the first Popeye's chicken scandal. Hmm. Our people went crazy for that flesh. Back in 2019, and back in whatever year this was too, to the point that we, we disrespecting the Most High, we disrespecting Moshe, we keep talking about, oh, how it was in Egypt. Right. 
But before we get to that part, uh, the part that made me kind of pause too when I was reading it uh, throughout the week, it was just when Moshe, to me, and you know this is no disrespect to Moshe, but it says that flocks and herds be slain for them. Wait, no, let's go up, sorry. The people among who I am are 600,000 men on foot, mm -hmm. and yet thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. So All as right. you can see, I ain't gonna read the whole thing, but as you can see, the most I had to remind Moshe who he was. Mm -hmm. Is Jehovah's hand waxed short? So that same doubt that Moshe had right there, because, you, you know, I, I feel like maybe sometimes we'd be afraid to call things what they are out of respect for our patriarchs. But like I said, they're human. So they're going to experience doubt. They're going to experience fear. We clearly see Moshe experience anger, depression, all these other things, emotions. So at this moment, he's experiencing doubt where... It's 600,000 people here to feed, and you telling me there's going to be enough for them to eat for a month? I mean, you know, let's, like, we're not really, because sometimes we read through the book, and then we get done, and we don't really think about it afterwards. We just go about, we have our lunch, we have second half, then Sunday starts, we go about the rest of our week. We're not really putting it, this into perspective. To this day, I wonder how they have so much chicken for all these restaurants. Hmm. Now, most of us know it's a lot of preservatives and all of these things that they put in it, but it's just like, how y'all have this much chicken? Enough chicken for us to buy and bring home to cook, for the restaurants to buy, for the fast food restaurants to buy. Hmm. And then you think about the amount of chicken that gets disposed from you know places that just don't sell it at the end of the day. They don't give it away, they throw it away. It's like, how y'all got that much chicken? So he's asking a fair question, but in him asking a fair question, it might be a fair question dealing with us, but not with the creator. Just because we ain't capable of understanding how it's being done don't mean the most high can't make it happen. And that's even something to think about in our own lives where it's all right to have doubt in that moment. It's okay to question how something going to happen because I'm pretty sure a lot of us have had something happen or where I'm going to get this or how I'm going to make this happen or how I'm going to fix this and the most high made a way. So, Steve? 24. And Moshe went out and told the people the words of Yehoah. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tent. And Jehovah came down in the cloud and spoke unto him and took up the spirit that was upon him and put it upon the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did so no more. But there remained two men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the, name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were recorded, but had not gone up out of the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. Then And there ran a young man and told Moshe and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Mm -hmm. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the minister of Moshe from his youth up, answered and said, My lord Moshe, shut them in. And Moshe said unto him, Art thou jealous for my sake? Would that all Jehovah's people were prophets, that Jehovah would put his spirit upon them? And Moshe withdrew into the camp, and he and the elders of Israel. And it went forth a wind from Jehovah. Okay. And brought across quails from the sea. All right now. And let them fall by the camp. About a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp and about two cubits above the face of the earth. And the people rose up all that day and all the night and all the next day and gathered the quails that were gathered least. And he that gathered least gathered ten heaps. And they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. While the flesh was yet between their teeth, mm -hmm. it was chewed the anger of Jehovah was kindled against the people. And Yehovah smote the people with a very great plague. Don't this remind y'all of the Popeye's chicken sandwich? Like, y'all don't remember when the Popeye's chicken sandwich came out? 2019, mm -hmm. all our people was going crazy, lined up, and then literally 2020, what happened? The world shut down. I'm like, wow. History really repeating itself. Our people, and one of the, you know, those of y'all that are old enough to know, there's a stereotype about black people and us loving fried chicken. Mm. Now, everybody loves fried chicken, but right. for some reason, that's one of the negative stereotypes about black people. So right here, we see where the Most High gave us chicken this way, this way, all on the side, and it said two cubits. That's about that's three right. feet high. Mm -hmm. Three feet high, and quails, you know, they little, if I'm not mistaken, they're smaller than chickens, but regardless, that's a lot of flesh. That's right. And they so happy to get this blessing. They're not even considering the fact that you just offended the person that gave it to you. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of us seen Game of Thrones, but 
you know, like I, like the kings or whoever, you have somebody test your food and test your drink before you eat it. Right. They just so caught up in their selfish desires. They're not even considering the fact that, all right, this just came out of nowhere. And these could literally have been sick chickens because, you know, the most high, he going to make happen what, what he made happen. And they just so busy, you know, thinking about they, they desires, they earthly desires, they fleshy, flesh, uh, tongue tied. Mm-hmm. But they, they, they're caught up in their desires and not considering the fact that how did these things get here? How did it come about? I promise you, none of them even probably, you know, said, told out Yehovah. Mm-hmm. None of that. Yeah. It was like, oh, it's flesh here now. Started grabbing it, and it said heaps. I tried to find a measurement for heaps. There is no concrete definition. So just assume that they took a lot. That's not, even that, it's not, we don't even know. You got long arms. You got long arms of me. That's the heap for you. Mm-hmm. So I guess the heap for, heap, heap for each person is a little different, but there's no actual measurement. But they had so much that everyone that partook of it fell by a plague. Mm-hmm. Tosif? And the name of that place was called Kibrot Hata'awa, because they were buried the people that lusted. Because there they buried the people that lusted. From Kibrot Hata'awa, the people journeyed from Haz- unto Hazerot, and they abode at Hazerot, chapter 12. Mm-hmm. And Miriam and Aharon spoke against Moshe because of the Cushite woman who he had married, for he had married the Cushite woman. And they said, Half Yehoah indeed spoken only with Moshe, have he not spoken also with us? And Yehovah heard it. Now, mm-hmm. now the man Moshe was very meek above all the men that were upon the face of the earth. And Yehovah spoke suddenly unto Moshe and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye three unto the tent of meeting. And they three came out. And Yehovah came down in the pillar of cloud and stood at the door of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth and he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, Yehoah, do make myself known unto him in a vision. I do speak with him in a dream. My servant Moshe is not so. He is trusted in all my house. With him do I speak mouth to mouth, Mm. even manifestly and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of Yehoah doth doth he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant against Moshe? And the anger of Yehovah was kindled against them, and he departed. And when the cloud was removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous as white as snow. And Aharon looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. If you don't remember what I just said not too long ago, maybe about an hour, go ahead and rewind it and listen to what I was saying about how, you know, we we may talk about people and, and things and That's consider... Because... Right. This thing right here, you know, I know I spoke about it before when I was up here, but that was dealing with Yosef and his brothers. And I also spoke about David with his father and brothers. And sometimes we really got to be mindful that just because they're your family and you used to seeing them a certain way, that don't mean the most high didn't choose them for a mission. We, we get very comfortable with seeing a person in our own light or we used to them being a certain character in our story, not realizing that the most high has more in store for them. And, you know, this is his big sister at that. So it's one thing for the people to talk against Moshe, but this is his kin. So now a lot of times we gotta we don't really realize that you you know, the words hurt more when it comes from somebody that's closer. Mm. And but more times than not, that's who we give our most attitude to, and that's who we give get our most attitude from. It be families that that uh, sibling rivalry, or even you know sometimes spouses may have their spats, and it's just like. Be mindful of what you say in your moments of anger because them words can't be taken back. That's right. Same thing about I was just saying earlier about that good name is hard to regain. You can't take back, you know, hurtful words. Mm. And that may live with a person a lot longer. And all she did was speak something, and now she became leprous. Why? Because she is in a powerful position enough to influence the people to do the same. It's one thing if they're doing it on their own and being foolish, but she's in a position where she has influence. So now if she, if nothing happens to her and her speaking against Moshe, despite the fact that this is her brother, then that's going to cause the people to feel comfortable in continuing to do it. Mm-hmm. So the Moshe, no, the most I had to punish her in this situation to show I chose Moshe to lead y'all, have some respect. Mm-hmm. 
I don't speak in p- dreams to him. That's I don't right. speak in parables. I don't, none of that. No riddles, no nothing. I speak to him face to face, mouth to mouth. That's right. I talk to him directly. That's a lot right. of times we have a thought in our mind and be like, oh, should I do that? Is that a thought from the creator? You know, sometimes we'll do it and it's like, okay, it worked out. You know, and then we won't do it and it's like, oh man, I should have did it. But this ain't one of those situations because we all have that intuitive thought that comes to us where it's like, maybe I should or maybe I shouldn't. There is no question in this situation. The only one that had questions in this situation is when the Most High told him, at Moshe, after, after Moshe got the instructions, he was the only one that had questions. Whereas with us, when we get the thought, like it says here, wait, sleek eye. Here we go. I, Yehoah, do make myself known to him in a vision. I do speak with him. I do speak with him in a dream. Wait, sleek eye. Mm-mm. He's talking about the prophets. Right. right. Hear, not, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, Yehoah, I, Yehoah, do make myself known unto him in a vision. I do speak with him in a dream. My servant Moshe is not so. He is trusted in all my house. With him I do speak mouth to mouth, even manifestly and not in dark speeches. And sometimes that, you know, that subconscious thought or that, you know, those thoughts that we have in our mind, we, we kind of question it more times than not, but sometimes it is from the creator. We question it because we know it's the thought in our head and we hear our own voice. Even, matter of fact, even recently I learned that some people don't have the internal dialogue. Like, I, I don't... And, so this may sound weird to some of us because when I first heard it, I'm like, you can't think in your head and have a com- like not a conversation with you, but that same way where you just think in your head like, should I say something right now? It's like some people can't think that. And I'm just like, wow. But even getting back to this, we be in our own minds, most I could be telling us something, we ignore it because we're not recognizing it's the word from him. Whereas with Moshe, most high speaking so clear and directly to him, he know who it's coming from. There is no questions. Tosif. And Aharon said unto Moshe, O my Lord, lay not, I pray thee, sin upon us, for mm-hmm. that we have done foolishly and for that we have sinned. Let her not, I pray thee, be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moshe cried unto Jehovah, saying, Heal her now, O Yah, I beseech thee. And Jehovah said unto Moshe, If her father had but spit in her face, Mm. Should she not hide in shame seven days? Let her be shut up without the camp seven days, and after that she shall be brought in again. And Miriam was shut up without the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again, and afterward the people journeyed from Hazerot and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So with that, she caused the nation to be delayed for a whole week just off of the strength of what she said. So let us be mindful in our lives of the things that we say and do, because more times than not, the things that we think we want or the things that we think we deserve, we're the ones that cause the delay Mm. because of how we conduct ourselves, because of the mindsets that we have in certain situations. All of the things that we do, not only do we need to be mindful of ourselves, but more so be mindful of Yehovah. Are we conducting ourselves in a way in which he would find pleasing? Are we moving in a way in which he, he would find right? So... If you're not considering, which is what I started off with this, that's why I went to Ecclesiastes, where it talks about the house of mourning. Because sometimes we get too caught up in our phones, we get too caught up in Instagram, we get too caught up in TikTok. We watch, we have a thousand and one streaming services, Mm -hmm. so we have a million and one distractions. Right. We don't have time to consider the things that we should be considering, because the first thing we do is we want to get that endorphin release. We want to, ha, 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 share this, and we're missing out on a lot of blessings. That's why we're a little bit stagnant as a people right now. I ain't talking about Israel. I'm talking about mankind. We're all a little bit stagnant right now because we don't take the time to consider and spend a little bit less time on the phone and a little bit more time in the book. That's right. I pray that nothing I said offended anyone, and I pray that you all got something out of what I said. Anything or any mistakes that I made is the fault of my own and not DCB. Uh, Shabbat Shalom to Kim. Shabbat Shalom to Kim.